Well, hey, CrossCart fans. what I'm doing. I'm on the two-seater right now and I'm doing everything I should have done as I was building it. Uh, if you check out the new video tips on assembling the frame, <laughs> this is where I learned that from. So I built this, I tacked everything together, I got the engine mounted, I got the A-arms mounted, I got the steering done. Basically a roller ready for pedals and electrical and then I realized that everything's just tacked together. So now I have to tear everything apart. I have to finish all the welds on the basic chassis and then put everything back on to continue working on it. So that's what I'm gonna do. Uh, it's winter time, so I'm building. So some of the hangups I've had on this is the track width. Now, this is obviously an awesome race car. Uh, the track width is sitting around 70 inches, which is pretty aggressive um, for a cross cart, for a go-kart, all right? This is more car size and I like the sub mini stuff. <laughs> so how I have it set up is I'm running spacers on the back. They're one inch spacers to correct the four by 100 to a four by 110 bolt pattern to fit my wheels. Uh, now, obviously I redrill the hubs for four by 110 so I can pull in the rear two inches to make it under 70 inches wide. Now the front end I'm using a razor hubs and A-arms and spindles and all that. Um, I'm using just the axles without the CVs on them to make a stub axle. And they're great, and I'm hung up on whether I should use the outlaw front ends, because I really like them. Uh, with these, I'm limited to only running 12-inch wheels, which is fine. Uh, it's a bigger car, so 10-inch wheels would look silly on it, I think. Uh, I think it should only run 12, but it's just outside my norm, so I gotta put a lot of thought into it before I finalize anything. How those front spindles work, they have like a pinch joint around the ball joint, and it's not fitting together as tightly as I want it to. Now, I bought these, and they didn't come with the hardware. It seemed like they came out of a razor that had burned to the ground. <laughs> so, I'm not even sure if they're strong enough to be on this cart. Uh, just because I got them secondhand and they were a little weird. You got to be careful about buying secondhand stuff. Now, the rubber bushings, seals, all that were not burned up, so maybe it was just not taken care of correctly. Uh, I think I'm going to revisit the seats because they don't have enough tilt. Uh, the tilt is what gives you that driving experience. The whole driver fit up process is what really makes this feel exactly how you think it should feel. So if you're building it and something doesn't feel right, this is your cart. You can make it exactly how you want it to be. It's the beauty of all this, and I love it so much. So my immediate future, figure out spacers, figure out front end, put a tilt on the seat, revisit driver fit up, put a floor on it, and get those pedals in. So let's, let's, let's get cracking. So I disassembled the chassis. Uh, I finished all the welding, so this is all just sturdy right now. Uh, I did leave the steering cross member not welded, just because I want to fine tune the steering. It seems to have a little too much Ackerman, so moving that bar forward and back can fine tune how much Ackerman you have. Uh, right now I'm working on the seats. Mo Some of you guys know uh, everything I do, I'll revisit it before I finalize it. If I like it, I'll keep it. If I don't, I'll tweak it and then finalize it. It's usually not more than just one revisit. 
Uh, so all I did was I cut an angle so that instead of sitting flat, it now sits, I don't know, what is that, two degrees maybe? One or two degrees? And that's just a, a fine little piece of tuning that I did. So I'll get the passenger seat welded in, finalized. I also fine tuned the spacing between the seats. When I first did it, uh, the seats were actually like, I don't know, 16th of an inch apart. They were pretty much touching. So just fine tuning that little gap, fine tuning uh, position forward and back, tilt, everything is really just getting this exactly how I want it, which is what it's all about. Well, here we go. Two seats mounted exactly how I want them. The lean back gives a ton more head room and it's actually pretty comfy in here. Oh, hey, Dune. Come here, check this out. So now we can ride two people. <laughs> What do you think? Is that comfy? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We have to get you a nice little grab bar there or something. I need something over here too. <laughs> well, I guess it's time to do the steering, front end stuff. All right, so let's have a conversation about front ends, okay? So this here is off a Polaris Predator 500. Now that's a solid axle bike with a 500cc Fuji engine. Excellent donor for a single seater. And it would be, in my opinion, this is all my opinion, it'd be a great donor for a two seater if it wasn't for this upper A arm. This right here looks just a little thin for me. But otherwise, the hub looks good to me. It's cast aluminum. The tie rods look good. The lower A arm looks good. It's got a cool bend in it. And the shocks are obviously good. They're those nice Fox podium shocks. But for the two seater, this just isn't cut it for me. So we'll save that for a VF1 build. All right, so first is the A-arms off of a Raptor 660. And these are what I use on my number five 100 horsepower single seat cross cart that I've had well over 100 miles an hour in the dirt everywhere. And these have been pretty solid. Uh, the downfall of them is the brakes. It's got a very, very small uh, front brake. It's a single piston. There's not much area to it. It's got a small disc, but uh, we're gonna be upgrading that uh, in a very future episode. So stay tuned for that. The ball joints are big enough for the application, uh, but they are the narrowest, okay? So let's get some measurements. Now, I tell you that you can use the front A-arms off of any ATV. Uh, any sport ATV, obviously utility ATVs have shorter A-arms uh, if you dip back into the older models. But these sport quads have wide front suspension. That's why they're sport quads, okay? So the 660 lower is what I go off of. From the bolt to the face of the hub is right around 18 inches, maybe 17 to three quarters, okay? Now, most of these you can get plus size A-arms so you can still use your hubs, brakes, everything, and they'll send you the arms and matching tie rod to extend your front end, and you can kind of dial in a front end that you want. Uh, I believe the A-arms on the number five are one inch extended front A-arms, um, which makes, makes it line up a little better. Next on the list is the Polaris Outlaw 525 front A-arms. These are one inch face-to-face -face wider side so these are going to be two inches wider in the front than the raptor 660 arms uh, these have awesome brakes they're two piston calipers uh, the bearings are good the ball joints are stout it's got greasable ends um, and it's got four bolts instead of two long bolts i'm not a big fan of the long bolt if you've ever had a quad and bent that bolt and tried to get it out and get it back in when you replaced your arm. It is a pain. Super strong otherwise, but just that's a little rough and you gotta figure out how to get those in and out and you have to be just cautious about it. Not a super big deal. Now, the Outlaw 525 and Outlaw slash Predator 500s use different hubs. The Predators, and the Outlaw 500s have a single pot brake on them. They're a lot bigger than this single pot brake, but they're still a single pot brake, so these are definitely better. Bolt, lower bolt to hub face, 
is 19 inches. Who knew? <laughs> it's one inch wider per size, so two inches overall. Now, here is what we have mounted on the two-seater, and this is a Razor 800 uh, front end, hub, A-arms, everything. Now, you can see I've modified it to run the shock off of the bottom A-arm, and that caused problems with, not, not problems, it caused uh, more attention to clearance. You can see these are nice and wide, making room for a shock to come through pretty easily. These are made to have a drive shaft run through them and your shock running off the top, which we could do. We could make shock hoops and run off top and it'd be super cool. Now the bearings on this are obviously a little bigger because you have a drive shaft running through it and a two piece hub, it's all cast, it's heavy, heavy duty. But here's the thing, the ball joints are the same size. Right, so the weak point of your assembly, your ball joints, your bearings, and the overall thickness uh, are the same. So, I mean, that's just my logic approach to all this, um, that these aren't too heavy for ATV arms because they use the same components as the big boy stuff. Now these are cast, but you have a drive shaft on it through them. So they're under, more stress than just a, a stub axle hub. Uh, the brake disc is bigger, the hub is heavier. Uh, it's the same bolt pattern, four by 156 on all three. And it has a two piston caliper brake on it too. But here's the thing, the Outlaw 525 and the Razor 800 take the same caliper. So these have the same braking force as the 800, but it doesn't have as big of a rotor. Still works, still works folks. So you're not gonna get a lot of heat dissipation, but you're half the weight. So you're gonna build not half the heat, but less heat. Construction wise, they're all made from the same uh, diameter of tubing. Uh, something I'll point out about the Razor is that they are narrower right so when you have a moment shifting front to back having a wider a arm is going to make them stronger right so that's just something to point out with this you can't go wrong with anything that you choose i am actually probably going to swap the razor for the 525 just because i've used them i know them i like them and i like this clearance up here to mount my shock cover i want this i'd have to cut all apart Okay, so I'll probably save this for a future project, project and I will work on switching out the tabs and aligning the Outlaw 525 arms. Now, the reason I have all this stuff, spares. So the first time I bent an A-arm uh, and I had to wait a week or over a week to get a replacement part, uh, I decided from then on that I was gonna have replacement parts. So I have a full set of A-arms for each of my carts. All right, let's get this swapped out. More on widths, track widths, all that after I get this stuff mounted up. Uh, we gotta do the rear end so I can kind of talk about it a little more. So the, the main things you're looking at is placement. Uh, I do my bottom arms first because that kind of just sets the tone for the rest of it. Um, obviously, I, I zip tie these in place to keep them out of the way and to get a good gauge. So on the lower AR mounting bar, you can slide it forward or aft a little bit. And I'm looking for clearance. I want my tires right at the leading edge of this. I'm running 25 inch tires, so I measure 12 and a half inches and that gets me right there. Now I, I've got some wiggle room if I want it. So now, now that the bottom arms are tacked in and I'm looking for uniformity on these too. Uh, I don't want them twisted. So I got them in place and I tightened them up. I don't want anything crooked here. So now the name of the game is caster, right? So I run six, five, six, seven, eight degrees of caster. You definitely don't want zero caster. Zero caster 
means that when you're going forward, if you turn the wheels too sharp, it'll just push. And you won't get that auto center when you're drifting. There's, there's a science on it, but five, six, seven, eight will get you there. So now we can slide this forward or back and I have the shock mounted. It's a pain in the butt being here, but I need to know that clearance. The top A arm only has a limited amount of space that you can mount it. And since this is a little heavier than an ATV, I am trying to mount the shocks kind of straight up and down to give more authority back to that spring. I did a great video on shock math and that's in it. As you lay this down, your springs become less effective. Uh, the more you stand it up, the more effective they are. So instead of coming in here and reducing my shock to like 60% of the spring rate, bring it out here and I'm still probably gonna get 90, 95%. Anywhere before you hit, if I remember right, it's like 18, 20 degrees, like you're still getting a good chunk of that. So I wanna run my top A arm as far back as I can and maintain uh, spring shock clearance. And that's looking pretty good right there. And I wanna leave some, some room in case I decide to come way out here. If I wanna make a bracket for multiple shock positions, I don't wanna limit myself to just this exact spot right here. I like it. I like it a lot right there. So now I'm going to take my boards. I'm going to move them to the top, make sure the tops are level, or I'm going to use this rotation. Uh, if you're using different A-arms than me, you might have a different length to the top. Well, that's why the tabs are on this round too. Uh, if you need to, you can rotate around here to get your, your proper alignment. Um, last resort would be to rotate these up if your A-arm is shorter than mine, or uh, kind of measure it out before you start and make your tabs longer. Speaking of tabs, you can also fine tune your track width with your tabs. Uh, I could have an extra inch on these tabs which would widen my track width by two inches. Now, if you do uh, a long mount off of here, make sure you box them in. And if you get super crazy with it, uh, support it in some way, you know, tie them together or find some other method of doing it. All right, so I'm gonna finalize this and then match the other side. So once I get this side aligned, that's why I'm spending so much time on side one, is once I get this all perfectly how I want it, I'm just going to match it on the other side. I'm gonna find points to measure it from and I'm going to just mirror it so that, so that my suspension, my front end, everything is symmetrical. All right, so what we can do now is we can pull the front end jigs off and we can put a wheel on there and visually check the alignment. Oh, and, and we could measure it, I guess. We could also measure the alignment, but Man, these things are so handy. It looks so good already. It looks like that's where our ball joints are bottoming out, which that would be a ton of clearance. I mean, our wheels are gonna be sitting like right here. Yeah. So cool. All right, so the 525 arms are mounted up and you can see it looks good. Room for the two pot brake. I can put 10 inch wheels on here, although I'll probably stick with the 12s because it's a two seater and it needs bigger diameter wheels and tires just to look good. So here's what I'm running into. So the tire, tire has plenty of room for a 25 inch tire, okay? I got 25 inch tires on here right now, but if I run anything bigger, I might get some rubbing. So, there is room to move these forward on the A-arm mounts. So that's what I'm gonna do. I wanna put my big agricultural tires on there just for the fun of it, have a little monster truck action. So I'm going to clearance for those, which means moving these forward, which means extending the wheelbase, but only by about three inches. I think it's 
three and a half inches I need, which isn't a big deal. There's room to do that. Another issue I'm running into is, you see these grease fittings? Now these tabs I made for the Razer 800 arms and I clearanced the grease fittings for those. These are hitting them. As the suspension flexes, as this rotates down, that is hitting the frame. So I need to lengthen these by like an eighth of an inch. It's a big pain in the butt, but that's what you run into. Um, making eight new tabs is not a big deal and it's not gonna throw off our alignment, especially when we use our jig. The alignment came out great. Look at that, zero camber, caster looks good. Everything looks good. So I'll cut those tabs, cut everything free, move it forward and it'll be golden. All right, let's see how we did. I've already pulled the bolts off of these, so it's just a matter of slipping these off. Now, basically what I did is I just ran them as far forward as I could. I'm not sure if it's gonna be enough for the big monster truck tires, but look at all that travel. That's where the ball joints are maxing out. So, since we have them all the way forward and I'm at the limits, we're really gonna have to watch this shock at the, uh, the lower limit to travel if we do that. But the shocks are gonna sit right there. There's no interference, it can't go down anymore. It can only go up. So let's see how much travel we have available. Now, my suspension is limited by the shocks I use uh, second hand. <laughs> If you bought long travel shocks, this would be a long travel machine. I see a lot of people wanting long travel stuff. Well, what is long travel? Uh, it's definitely not rigid. It's probably not five inches of travel, but where, what is that window? All that depends on the shocks. Let's get a tape measure and let's see if this would fit into a long travel category. Okay, so right now the hub nut is at six inches off the floor. We're gonna raise it up to twenty-two inches. So twenty-two minus six is sixteen. Sixteen inches of travel. Uh, I'm pretty sure sixteen inches of travel is long travel. Obviously, you need to get the shocks. You'd have to work the suspension to dial that in specifically, but. 16 is to travel. <laughs> I will take it. So now for the other side, if you've ever done brakes before, you know that the first side takes forever and the second side is it boppity bang. So all I've got to do is square out my tabs, give a visual check to make sure everything's good, tack it on, do a final check, and then I'm just gonna final weld these tabs and we'll call the front end done. All right, so check this out. Right now, we've got trailing arms set up, which are in the plans for the VF2, but not the VF1. Sorry, I haven't tested those yet, so I can't give you guys stuff I haven't personally tested. But on the VF2, there was such a huge request for trailing arms that I went ahead and designed some and just put them on as I built it. Uh, they work great so far, but some of you know my preference is A-arms. I like A-arms, the adjustability of them, the simplicity of them, the travel of them. All that stuff makes me want to do A-arms and as I was redoing this for the welding and getting it set up, I kind of thought about something. VF, right? Variable frame. Let's do both. So the trailing arms are already done, so we can also put A-arms on here. Now there's a catch to that. The A-arms are normally made from one inch tubing that takes its own specific heim joint. Well, that heim joint doesn't align very well with the inch and a quarter that you do with the trailing arms. So I'm just gonna take the plans and I'm gonna use inch and a quarter. So this is gonna have inch and a quarter A arms. Now, all this stuff was designed to be flexible, to be easy, to be customizable. So, the bend locations are going to be the exact same. The bend degrees don't change at all, right? The jigs are gonna work, everything's gonna work. 
you're just going to step it up to 125 if you want to. Obviously, one inch will work on this. Now, for the cut wrappers, that's the thing that gets people. The cut wrappers. Cut wrappers need to be printed at 100% regardless so they wrap around the tube correctly. But if you want to take cut wrappers that are for one inch tubing and apply them to inch and a quarter tubing, you just print them at 125%. Now, I'm not gonna do that because the A-arms are simple enough where all of the notches are on the same plane as the bends, all right? So we are going to notch it at the same plane as the bend. And how the cut wrappers are laid out, you are literally cutting on the radius of the bend. Now, I'm gonna try one if it doesn't work out. I'll reprint them at 125% so that I have a super accurate bend and notch for the a-arms so that's going to make this sucker the best vf yet is because we're going to be able to swap between trailing arms and a-arms on the fly maybe we'll be crazy and run a-arms on one side and trailing arms on the other <laughs> it'd be silly all right so that plane i was talking about is here all of this lies flat so your notch is going to be perpendicular to your bend so your cut wrappers don't need to be perfect as long as you understand that you just need a starting point or a reference of how far it goes in now since we're using inch and a quarter tubing instead of one inch something to be cognizant of is the length the length of your himes now these get adjusted to a certain amount but you can cut them off to fine tune them i think you have an extra I don't know, one inch, one and a half inches to pull the arms in if you need to. So if you have long heim joints, you can definitely do that. We'll cover that when we go to fit them up. But it's time to notch these and I've got a new thing. Uh, Rogue Fab, uh, my favorite company ever, they make the bender, the notcher I use. And now they've made deep hole saw cut. So a normal hole saw cutter Sorry, a normal hole saw bit is shallow. Now, why would it need to be long? If you're cutting an aggressive angle, you will bottom out on your hole saw before you get all the way through. Uh, a way to get around that is to just cut off the end with an angle grinder or cutoff wheel, uh, and that'll let you cut all the way through. It's this corner that stops you from getting all the way through. It's annoying, yeah, but with a deep well hole saw cutter, you can go through, I think I think it's like 45 degrees on one cut. So the first ones they did, uh, if you've been a super long time fan, the first ones they did, I didn't like them too much because they didn't have these clean out holes in them. It was just a solid piece. So once your piece got in there, it was really hard to get out, but they added clean outs. So when we cut through here, we can dig our piece out. Let's give them a shot, see how they work. Yeah, shove that bad boy right on there. All right, we've got a 35 degree cut to make. So off of 90, 10, 20, 30, 35.5. And that'll cover it. Now here's where we get our reference. We're gonna put our piece in here. Now, the idea is to get this bend directly on plane with the side of the machine. And if you just look from this side, it's clear the rotation of it. So we want this at a zero rotation. We want this lined up and this piece will be completely fat, flat. So I'll usually line it up first, get that semi tight enough to twist this, get a sight right down the end of it. And that's pretty, pretty squared away right there. I'll give a final check out on this. Crank this tight. Let's see what she does. Wow, it's a sharp blade. I like that. That just zipped right through it. Let's check the results here. Super nice clean cut, and we ended up right on our outside reference line.
Perfect. Now I'm going to trim this up. Let's check the fit up. I'm going to take my lower and I'm just going to center it right on the bottom part. And the front is the short side. Wow, look at that. The rear, the long side. Look at that. Look at that. Now we got to do is slice them off here. And like I said, there's more adjustment if you need it. Uh, the reason there's this extra bit uh, for longer A arms if you want, but also to fit in the bender. So, oh, yeah, it's exciting. Now, the same deal goes for your cross members. They're on this the same plane. So, I'll take an extra piece of matching tube and I'll put it right on the end and I will rotate it until the notches are going to match. See that? Perfectly, well, maybe not. There we go. Perfectly perpendicular. Uh, that's only for cross members on the same plane, not all your cross members. So it's just a way to get it incredibly accurate. Like butter. So nice. Look at that. I got a piece jammed in there. Before, this would have been a huge problem. But now with these clean outs, boom. 100% better Rogue Fab. Thank you for that. Now, when it comes to mounting A-arms, it can be super easy. Uh, the geometry, it's square. So whatever distance is between your bottom bolts, you want your front bolts or front A-arms to be at that same distance. Whatever distance between your top bolts, you want your top A-arms to be that same distance. Now, I have everything leveled. Uh, I have the frame up on jack stands. I have a board holding my rear brackets in place against the rear upright, and I have everything kind of laying here. I have this quarter inch plate that I'm gonna to use to gusset here, plus make a mount for my forward lower A-arm bracket. Now what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna measure from the floor to the bolt, and then measure from the floor to the bolt. I'm gonna cut this off so that there's clearance for the articulation. This is why I love A-arms. Look how easy this can be. Now, as you've seen before in previous videos, I'm gonna cut two notches that match my motor mount uprights, and I'm just gonna make a bracket that goes off of here. Uh, I'm gonna use the back side of it this time instead of the front side, because uh, when I notch that in, it's gonna bring that in enough to make a nice little bracket. And then just square it up, weld it, and we'll have rear A-arms. So easy. Now, one thing I am gonna take into consideration, now obviously I want these as low as possible to get the most ground clearance if I do a safari mode on this, but my rear end, I lifted it up for chain clearance off the bottom side of the motor. So, having our axles run out up here uh, may, well, it is going to increase the plunge. Typically with A-arms, you want your axle running right down the center so that your plunge is squared away. But there's really only one way to find out is put the rear end in, put the axles in, and do all of this at the same time. It's not that bad. We have all the parts built, so drop in the rear end, uh, make the tabs for our hubs, or we can kind of gauge it without it, and then we can lift lower. We may have to make new brackets that widen this a little bit. It's all easy. You just have to take your time and do the measurements. All 
All right, so here's where we're sitting. I won't bore you with the uh, time-lapse uh, fabrication stuff with simple stuff you can understand. So we raised the carrier one inch to make clearance off of our motor. So I made new rear brackets that are an inch longer to make room for the axle. It was a little close for comfort and it doesn't take long to make these. So I just made them. Um, then I got a brick which is a super useful tool. It's nice and flat. I can lay my A-arm flat on it. I can adjust it in its final position. I checked the plunge of the axle and I came all the way out. And then I came about a quarter inch back in and also have adjustments on my hinds. Now on my A-arms, I don't know if it's this inch and a quarter or the angle of the tubing, but I trimmed five eighths off the bungs. Now the bungs go down into the tube, so they're still going to be plenty strong. I could probably cut them off all the way if I needed to. So then I measured out my tabs, made tabs for the bottom, and I made the tabs for the top. And I have a piece of wood here, and I have this level, a little visual alignment. Final alignment's going to be on the uh, A-arm hinds. All right, so now we need to make the lower forward mounts and they're just gonna be boxed in. Uh, I've got an inch and a half flat bar here and to give you a visual, they're basically just gonna sit on a plate, which I've already made the plate. I'll show you that here in a second where it's gonna go. And it's just gonna hold our hymen in place. Now we can't make it unless we had two inch flat bar, which I only have an inch and a half. So we're just gonna rotate it and I'm gonna give some clearance for flexibility, for travel, for movement, whatever you wanna call it. And I've measured that at an inch and a quarter from the center of the hole. So I'm gonna come in my usual five eighths to the center of the hole, and then I'm gonna go an inch and a quarter to the base is what I came up with. And I'm gonna visually verify that that's gonna be enough clearance yeah, that's gonna give me plenty of angle. Yep, so I'm gonna make uh, two of these per side and then uh, just this flat piece to box it. All right, now before we cut the box part, I'm gonna give you guys a super hot blazing tip. Now, if you're gonna have your cart powder coated, there is a thickness to powder coat. So what I do is I take a washer, like an eighth inch washer, and I will put it between all of my brackets, tabs, whatever you wanna call them, before I finalize them. So this is what we're looking at right here. So let's get this in the vise. And that's gonna square it up. Now we're just gonna take some two inch and we're gonna measure how wide it needs to be for us to get a piece of weld on it, which would be two and an eighth. Let's give that a quick double check. Uh, I do want to get this tight before I weld this bracket on, just so it's nice and square. This hive should handle just tack welding together. Uh, once we get it in the cart, uh, we'll finalize all the welding on there without the hive joint. All right, so here's how I'm going to do this. I have a jack stand sitting here holding the A-arm in place. Now I'm going to take my plate that I made. And all I did was measure, measure clearances for this and how I wanted it to sit in there and just trimmed it up so it would fit nice. It's nothing too crazy. So then you can see the bracket we just made, the tab, whatever you want to call it. And we're just going to assemble it right here. Now from here, I'm going to double check the measurements uh, between the bolts for alignment like that. 
I'm gonna make sure this plate is level however I need to. I'm gonna measure distance from the floor to the bolt on the front and back to make sure it's all square. And I'm just gonna weld it in. Look how nice that is. The only thing I see is we might have to trim some of this plate off depending on where it sits. Uh, I tend to give just a little extra uh, just in case it's easier to trim than to add metal. So it's kind of just a habit. So first side is done, it's squared, it's lovely. Now, I will point out one thing, because I'm honest with you guys, that shaft not being centered on the upper and lower A-arm like I usually do, raising it that inch, kind of wreaked havoc on the plunge. So I don't have as much travel because of the plunge. So if travel is a huge deal to you, then make sure you center that axle between your bolts, between your A-arms, all right? I use the bolts on the rear as reference and you can see it's on the high side. So rear A-arms are like brakes. <laughs> the first side took a long time. And then the second side, I'm literally just throwing it together because I already did all the work. I did all the math and fab work and stuff. So I have my second plate affixed to the rear end. Uh, I've got my plate on the jack. I've got this. Now I did double check my measurements. So now that I have a second one, I can compare measurements from these two bolts. Well, the bottom ones, uh, the top and bottom. You match those up, make sure your bolts are nice and straight. Uh, measure your height, everything, and make sure it's squared. And I just cut two tabs of everything. So everything's just gonna match up and be symmetrical. And final alignment's gonna be on the heim joints. Yeah, love it. And that's it, all done. So now we have the option of A arms or trailing arms on the same machine. Not bad. Now, just to give you a look at the travel and what I was talking about. Watch the center carrier. That's gonna be the, the tail tail of when we're running out. So I guess that's bottomed out. Bring it up. Wow, oh, I take it back. We, that's a pretty decent amount of travel. Yeah. Not too bad at all. I have a massive mess to clean up. So I hope you guys' builds are going great and I'll catch you on the next one. Enjoy the build. cool is this? Got A arms on one side, trailing arms on the other side. So cool. You can swap them out for wherever you're riding. You can have A arms or trailing arms. I love it. So, the reason I did this is because I like A-arms. I just, I just like them. They're my thing and they work well for me, but I respect your opinion. So, trailing arms, or both, or either. 
We're gonna have a futuristic, crazy riding vehicle. Look at that. Oh, this two-seater is going to be fantastic with the Hayabusa making your passenger scream. Oh, I love this one so much. Oh, it's gonna be so filthy. 